weeks now we've been able to come into the baptistry to be able to see that people who've given their life to the Lord, who says, I want to make Jesus Lord of my life and follow him in baptism, what a great way it is to start service today. So, Drew, I'm going to ask if you would, you come down. Drew has uh, been a part of the church for, for some time now. He's been coming and, and serving a couple of weeks ago on Easter. God was just dealing with his heart, and he realized that he needed to surrender his heart to the Lord and make him Lord of his life. And he came forward that Sunday. Y'all know how bold that is just to step out <laughs> and to be able to say, I know that I need Jesus. That's what Drew did that day. He stepped out and he said, I need Jesus. He put his faith and trust in Jesus and made him Lord of his life. And today we come to baptize him. Amen. Drew, what is your public profession of faith? Jesus, Jesus is Lord. I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.
That's right. <laughs> You're right. <laughs>
The last thing is, um, I know Pastor Keith mentioned earlier, but there is a little taste of Italy in the gym. So we have a luncheon that is raising money for kids camp. And so the menu, you'll have a choice of soup or salad. You'll have a choice of chicken, alfredo, or baked spaghetti. We have homemade pizza rolls as an entree for kiddos. And then there are four desserts, uh, tiramisu, cheesecake, zippelis, and cannoli dip. Um, we have sweet tea, water, and regular tea. I don't think we have no sweet tea. And lemonade. Um, but that is the menu, so we would love for each one of you to come and be a part of that and allow our children to serve you lunch. Uh, travel. 
Shelby, she said, God, I've done a great job. What an awesome privilege it is to know that I can step away and to be able to do what God's calling. And God has equipped our church with godly men Amen. who can step in and take me and help us. Uh, uh, his name is going to come, and he's going to, he's going to be preaching this morning. And uh, he gave me an opportunity just to clear my head and, and to be able to think about nothing but what God was showing me while I was there on the field. And so uh, what an awesome opportunity this morning just to be able to be fed. Thank you, Chris, and if you would, if you would come. I want to pray for us as Chris comes. Our dear Father, I just ask right now in the name of Jesus that, Lord, that you would speak to our hearts that lives would be changed. Holy Spirit, I know that you are here. Speak to us in a mighty way. Father, if there's one here that does not know you, I pray that today would be the day of salvation. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay, I can hear myself. Y'all can hear me. I'm going to pull this thing back because I think it's been kind of a crutch to me. I can kind of stand behind that thing and hide. <laughs> the Lord moved me a long time ago out from behind that thing just for that reason because it gave me a place to hide. Um, you know, last last Sunday, by the way, Keith, uh, Keith don't know, but my granddad was a Baptist preacher for probably 50 years. And he's the one that really mentored me when I began to preach. My, my granddad would sit and talk to me about what it means to pastor and preach and all this stuff. He gave me a story one time about a, uh, his music ministry. He said music had gotten where it got longer and longer and longer in his church. Um, and people like, always want to get out at 12 o'clock. Well, where's the service? It starts at 11. So his mu music ministry got to his 30 minutes. Then it got to his 45 minutes. And it got to his 50 minutes one Sunday. So he turns it over to my granddad, and, and he, he comes up to the pulpit, and the guy says, I'm sorry, preacher, but I took all your time today. You ain't got the 10 minutes left. And he said, it's no problem. I'm going to take my time. You just go ahead. <laughs> he said he usually preached about a 20-minute sermon, but that day he said he preached an hour. Just <laughs> so, you take as long as you want to, because I've been trained just, just to go for it. <laughs> God's laid something on my heart today, so I'm I'm going to share it with you. I um, appreciate Josh last week. He was talking about worship. And in talking about worship, he talked about how when we gather together for worship, you know, it should be that, that time that, you know, we're not worried about what's going up on going on up on stage. We enjoy all, you know, I enjoy seeing their faces and seeing the, the joy in, in them as they're singing. But at some point in that worship, does it get to the point it's just us and God? Do we realize that, that worship is about us speaking to our Creator and our Savior, just praising Him for what He's done and, and just enjoying His presence? I appreciate Josh bringing that out last week. Um, and then we move from there. We move into the Word. And we, you know, we have this worship time where we come together and sing praises to Him. And then we move into the Word. Uh, I appreciate Brother Keith's preaching. And, you know, last. As, as, as he was preaching uh, two weeks ago, I was listening, and, and something happened as he was preaching that uh, that's, that is, is very commonplace, and I hope it's commonplace for you. Uh, something that I've, I've noticed in the 20-something years that, that I've passed here, uh, you know, very often God will speak to you in the middle of that sermon, and it might not have anything to do with what the words that he's saying. Uh, I realized this phenomenon when I was preaching and, you know, in the car, I'd, I'd be preaching and I'd study it all week and I'd, I'd get to the end of the sermon and think, okay, I think I got everything out that God gave me. I believe I delivered the sermon exactly the way he wanted it. And so I think I did. I was faithful in, in discharging my duty of doing that. And we would get in the car and, and, and on the way home, I would ask Andy, so, so how did that go? Did that point come across? Did, did, did you get what I was trying to say? Because I, I wasn't as good as Keith is about laying out those three points of a sermon and, and that alliteration where everything starts with an R or starts with a P. <laughs> if I used the English alphabet on all of my points, I was doing great. But, you know, we got, we got in the car. This, the first time this happened, we got in the car, and I was, I was thinking, so, so did, that, did that come across? And she said, it did. What was so great? I said, well, what was your favorite part? She, 
Well, what was so great it was when God said so and so and this and this and this. And I said, I just let her go ahead and finish. And I said, I stopped before I got to those verses. That wasn't part of my sermon. And her favorite part of my sermon was something I didn't even say. <laughs> is, is that not humbling, men? <laughs> Have you ever shared, shared a message or shared, shared something that, that your wife, the favorite part of what you said was something you didn't even say? But, uh, you know, the first time I chopped it up, the, well, you know, that was just something weird until it happened over and over again. And then I realized the same thing goes on with me whenever I'm listening to other men. I want to just share with you this morning, uh, really a couple of times that that's happened in the last couple of weeks uh, when Keith was speaking. I want to give you my examples so that maybe it opens your eyes to listen as God is speaking. You know, two weeks ago, he was in John chapter 21. And we're going to talk about John chapter 21 in just a moment. But there in John chapter 21, uh, he that is going through the story of, of, of those disciples and they're out there fishing and he tells them to cast your net on the other side of the boat. So, so he is talking, they've got those R's. you got the roadblocks, the journey to, to Galilee, I believe it was. And you got those roadblocks along the way, that discouragement and these other things that, that causes those issues along the way. And then you had the road to recovery as he starts bringing Peter back, back to him when we saw it. And then the road to reconciliation when he turns Peter around. But somewhere in that road to reconciliation, I got lost. And I, truthfully, I, I, I take notes. I like taking notes. And, and you should take notes. I, I, I encourage you to take notes. Get all those, those points that, that, that God has laid on Keith's heart. And you need to get those points and, and, and get those down. And those are very important. But the, the, the most important thing that happens in service is when God says something to you. When God speaks to your life. And truthfully, my, my notes ended that day at recovery. Because once he got to reconciliation, I, I got the title. And then he got down to verse 15. And as he got to verse 15, and, and I'm, I'm not going to read all this again. But as he got to verse 15, Jesus comes to Peter and he says, Peter, do you love me? Agape. That God-sized, sacrificial, give it all up kind of love. He said, Peter, do you love me like this? And Peter said, John. You know I love you. And in, in, in our King James and their English translations, those, those sound the same. And Pete, uh, Pete, Pete was one of my former pastors, so you're going to get called that all the time, Keith. I'm sorry. He was a good man. He is a good man. But he, as he went through that, he, he explained to us the difference in those two. You have the, 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 agape, the agape love, that's, that's that unconditional love, that sacrificial love that, that God has given to us and that we only have through our, through our relationship with him. And that flail love is, is that that brotherly love, not, not the blood kin, but the, the love that we have for our fellow man, that, that kind of love. The kind of love of why they named the city of Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love, the, the, the love that we have for everyone else. And so Jesus asked Peter, he says, Peter, do you love me unconditionally? And Peter says, Jesus, you know I love you like a brother. He told us all this, right? He's actually asking me, he says, do you love me unconditionally? And he says, you know I love you like a brother. And then he says, Peter, do you really love me like a brother? In the Greek, the word changes. He says, Peter, do you really even love me like a brother? And it says that he will. Or he says, it says it. What's, what's the word it used? It says, it says that, that it grieved him is what it says. And he says, Lord, you know I love you. And that's as far as I got with, with anything that he said. Because by the end, the Lord had already said, Chris, you love me. And I'm, and I'm with Peter. I'm saying, Lord, you know I love you. Lord, you, you died for me. Lord, I'm a believer. Lord, I, I, I serve you in any way I can. You know I love you. And what he had to keep hitting me with, as Keith's preaching his heart away, is but do you adopt me? Do you really love me unconditionally? 
Do you really love me regardless? Or do you just love me when everything goes your way? <coughs> so as, as he was finishing up that, he had already asked me what I, what I feel in this morning, so I'm already, I'm already writing notes down. I don't want to miss anything the Lord says. But I'm already, I'm already taking notes on, on, on what the Lord is saying. It, And I just want to talk about, for, for just a few minutes this morning, the love that, that he has for us. I love, I love seeing Keith's notes. Y'all ever see his book? It's, it's, it's all pretty and got all these little notes. Y'all can't see that, but that's my notes. I got scribbled over here and I wrote something down here and then I made something over here. And, and I ain't gonna pick up my notes. And let, let me see something. And, she can't read anything in my notes. <laughs> that, that's not possible. But what, what he told me that day as I was sitting there, he says, if you love me, it should show up somewhere. Do we not talk about that in our marriage relationship? We talk about, you know, I can tell Amy I love her. I can say I love her, but unless I show her somehow, she's probably not going to believe it, is she? And that's what he tells us in his word. He says, if you love me, it's going to show up. And, and Keith has talked about this. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. He gives us that, that as a picture. He said, he, that, that if we want to know if we love him, he said, it's going to show up. It's going to have an effect on our lives. It's going to have an effect on the way we, way we live. It's going to have an effect on, on how we act and, and what we say and, and what we do if, if we truly love him. He tells us there's one that came to him one time and asked him, Lord, what's the greatest commandment? And what does he say? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. So he says if we love him, we'll keep his commandments. And if we keep his commandments, what is his commandments? To love him. Almost sounds like circular reasoning, doesn't it? That's how important love is in this relationship that we have with him. That he says that it's going to show up in our lives. It's going to show up in the way we act. It's going to show up in the way that we live. There's going to be some evidence of that love in our lives. And if we're walking around saying that we are a believer, and we don't have that kind of love for our Savior, the one that died on the cross for us, maybe we need to spend a little time checking up on that salvation. Do we truly know Him? I'm not here trying to get you to, to doubt your salvation. If you've had that, that genuine time of coming and trusting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I'm not trying to do that. But I do want us to make sure we've made our call on the election sure. That we know, that we know, that we know. How many times I've heard my daddy say that when he preaches? That, that it's not something that we worry about. It's not something that we hope so. Now, we don't need a hope so salvation, but we need to know that we know that we know that our names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Amen. It's nothing that I've done, but I know if I die today where I would spend eternity. Amen. I know when I draw that last breath here, I know I'm going to the presence of, of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Not because of anything I've done, but because of what He's already done for me. The price that He's already paid. Hey, do, do we have that assurance? Over in, in 1 John chapter 2. If y'all want to chase me today, you're welcome to just chase me all over the place. This is not one of those nice little organized three-point sermons that I would love to give you. This is a just chase me and, and let's see what the Lord's got to say kind of day. We had one of these in our Sunday school class a couple of weeks ago. I wore my class out that day. I think we went through about 50 scriptures that day, didn't we, class? Every once in a while, we just, we just going to chase the Lord and see what he has to say. First John, I believe First John gives us a list of, of tests. In, in chapter 5, verse 13, he says, These things have I written that you may know that you have eternal life. And I think I think First John gives us some, some, some instruction. This, this Look at your life and see, does it line up with this? I, I'm showing you some things that you may know that you have eternal life, that you, that you won't have to doubt. And one of the things he gives us is in 
1 John chapter 2, beginning in verse 3, he says, And hereby we do know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. One of the marks, he says, to know that we're a believer is that we're following God. But then read verse 4. He that saith, I know him, and keep not his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoso keepeth his word in him verily is the love of God perfected, hereby know we that we are in him. God, God gives us the assurance that we can know him. He gives us the assurance that we can know for sure that, that our name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And he says, just look and see how the word of God is working in your life. Look and see how, how the love of God is working in you. Because if you're filled with the love of God, the natural outflow of that. He talked about that when he had his sign up here, didn't he? That that natural outflow of that relationship with God, when we're close to him, the natural outflow of that is just going to spill out on other people. That cup's going to run over and run over to other people. Run over in every relationship that we have. So 1 John tells us, just look at our life and see. Does it line up? Luke 6 and 46 says, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not what I say? He says, How do you claim me as Lord and you won't listen to me? How do you claim me as Lord and you won't do, do the very things I've told you to do? In, in Matthew chapter 7, in, in, beginning in verse 22, he gives us a picture that Jesus said, there's coming a day when there's so those that's going to stand before me and they're going to say, Lord, Lord, look at all that I've done. Look at all my works. I've cast out devils in your name. I've healed diseases. I've, I've done this and that and all these other things. He says, but he says, depart from me, you workers of iniquity, because I never knew you. They're just claiming with our mouths, Lord, doesn't mean that we truly know him as our Lord and Savior. Do we see evidence of that in our lives? Do we see evidence of the love of God play out in, 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 our, react, in our, our interactions with other people? Do we see that in our faithfulness to God? James 2 and 19 says, you believe that there is one God. That's good. Even the devils believe in Trump. I preached that, that passage before and said the only difference in the devil and a lot of people around us today is they don't tremble. It scares me to death the number of believers, people that claim to be believers, that never serve God in any way. And I believe it's been Christianity in our country's fault because for far too long we've told people all you've got to do is come forward, sign a card, raise your hand, just say yes, come and get baptized, and then everything's okay. I'm thankful for this church. I'm thankful for this man of God we've got right here. Amen. first Sunday that I came and he preached was our second Sunday here. He wasn't here the first time. He was off on a mission trip, believe it or not. <laughs> second Sunday we came, he preached a message, and I don't remember which one of y'all's kids it was. He comes down and sits right here on this bench and takes her by the hands and walks her through the gospel. And he didn't just sit there for five seconds and say, just repeat after me, now get up and everything's okay. Amen. He spent time sharing the gospel. He been, spent time going over the word to make sure she understood the truth of what she was about to do. She understood the truth of the message of the cross. And then he led her to, to say that prayer of salvation. We've got to get away from that easy, easy believism. Mm -hmm. That's right. We gotta get away from it. it's just just getting your name somehow on the church's roll. We want to don't want to diminish what the scripture says in Ephesians two and eight and nine. 
It says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Amen. The whole process is the gift of God. Jesus said, No one come to the Father, no one come to me except the Father draws him first. That God loves us so much that He desires to have that relationship so much that He draws us to Him. That, that we're going along. I think about myself when I was 16 years old, going to church, trying to do the right things, act, acting pretty much okay most of the time, obedient to my parents as much as they knew most of the time. But for sure, if you weigh my good and bad, my good and bad, for sure my good way, way outweighs my bad. So when I heard that preacher talking about being saved, I didn't, I didn't need that. Until one Sunday, we're standing and the preacher's standing down front and he's talking about Jesus dying for our sins and I'm thinking, that's not me. He's talking about Jesus showed his love toward us and God showed his love toward us that he sent his own son to die. Piano players started playing, and Saul started singing Just As I Am. And just as he started singing Just I Am, something happened. And I, I can't explain it to you. I can't explain it today. All I, all I know is all of a sudden I broke out in a cold sweat. All of a sudden I, I looked down and, I, and my knuckles my are turning white on that pew. And I'm thinking, Man, I ate some bad Cheerios this morning. So. <laughs> Y'all been there? I mean, I don't know what in the world's going on, but I know what it ain't. I know what it ain't. Today, some kind of change I need to make because look, I'm looking what I'm, I'm doing bad. I make it out of service. I survive it somehow. Come back the next week, same thing happens. I go out again. Come back the third time, aren't you? Aren't you just thrilled that God did not give up on you the first time? I'm so thrilled. God, God gave me three chances. I don't know what would happen after that third chance because that third time I'm, I'm sitting back in this pew about halfway back on this side. I, I look down and my, my knuckles are solid white. I look down at my shirt and it's doing that. <laughs> <laughs> my heart's just about to beat out of its chest and I'm thinking, Chris, you fool, you're going to stay here and die if you don't do something. <laughs> and I, at the edge of that beach and I stepped out. And I preach it theologically. Some of y'all may not like this. Some of y'all preachers may say, that ain't theological or whatever. I stepped out and when I put it to the floor, I was saved at that moment as I'll ever be in the moment of my life. That's right. And I said, Lord, I don't know what's going on. I don't understand all the big words they're talking about. But I know you died for me. Amen. And I'm never looking back. You know what God found me? I wasn't looking for it. Same way you found every one of you. It wasn't just some day that you got it all together and all of a sudden you figured it out and you said, well, I just got to have that. We all came the same way. That, that we were denying him. We were denying our need for him. We were talking about how good of church members we were. We talked about how good of a family we were in. We made every kind of excuse in the world of why we didn't need God. And God still knocked on that heart's door. And when he did, we turned it over to him. And there's some of you here today. There's some today that God is probably speaking to your heart. And we're going to offer an invitation here in just a little bit. We're not there yet. Keith, we still got a few more minutes. <laughs> But all I ask is you be open to listen to God when he speaks. Don't turn him away. Many of us have fought it before in our lives and it always comes back. God says, I'm not going to give up on you. This morning, don't turn, him away. don't turn him away when he speaks. But when we come to that moment of salvation, Paul says, we become a new creation. Old things have passed away and all things become new. Did you have that moment in your life? Do you remember that moment that you gave your heart and part of life to Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and He changed your life forever? Paul says we become a new creation those old things pass away. If we get up and walk out of that, that, that moment and we go right back to our life doing all the same things we ever did, 
We come right back. We, we join the church. We're coming baptized. And the next week, we're right back out in the world doing the same thing. Folks, we need to check up on our salvation. Because that's not my God. You're not going to find that in this book. I'm going to show you that in this book in just a moment. It's in here. But it doesn't have anything to do with salvation. We're going to see it in just a moment, though. He says, we become that, that, that new creation. Paul says in, in Galatians 2 and 20, that I've been crucified with Christ, yet I live. But it's Christ that lives in me. He says, the old Paul has died. The dead Paul is gone. I've been dead and I'm buried. And now Jesus lives in me. That's the relationship that he wants each one of us to have with him. That is what salvation looks like. Salvation does not look like getting our name on the church road, getting baptized, and then never showing back up for church. That's not salvation. And I'm scared to death that there's many going to stand before him one day saying, oh, well, I was, I was a member of so-and-so church. I was even baptized there. He said, but you never knew me. You never knew me. This morning, we'll make our call on election sure. Don't leave this place with any doubts this morning. I, I want to show you two pictures in, in the book of Revelation. I know one of our classes is going through the book of Revelation. So Revelation chapter 2. Hopefully y'all got past this in y'all's class. Revelation chapter 2. We're going to see two churches. I would like to say that since I accepted Christ my Lord and Savior in 16, that I've been perfect for the last here's the one, <laughs> 35 years. <clears throat> 35 years, two weeks ago, by the way. I would like to say for the last 35 years, I have followed Jesus every step of the way and I've been perfect. Wouldn't that be awesome? That ain't me. I slipped and I fell along the way. I maybe re relate more to, to let Paul's lesson in chapter 7 of Romans than any other piece of scripture. Paul said, I know what I need to do, but I just don't do it. I know the things I shouldn't do and end up doing them. I know the things that I'm supposed to do and I don't know those. And I know the things I tell other people don't do. And every once in a while I do those. Been there? No, I don't know it happens. But we deal with it when it comes, right? We confess that sin. First John says, we confess our sins faithful and just give us of that sin and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. In chapter 2 of, of Revelation, I want to show you both pictures. I want to show you those that have done like I've done. Everything was going good and then somewhere you, you stunk it up. And God said, hey, you need, to, you need to get back over here where you belong. And then I want to show you one that Jesus said, you just ain't got it. You just ain't got it. Ephesians, the, the church to, to Ephesus is verse 1. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, and walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works, thy labor, thy patience, and how thou... Canst not bear them which are evil, and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars, and hast borne, and hast patience for my name's sake, labored, and hast not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast, notice the word, left thy first love. I remember growing up and, and being under my my granddad's preaching. My, my granddad always said, I don't know if any of y'all knew J.D. Bearden from down in Cleveland County, preaching in Randolph County as well. Papa said he was a Baptocostal. <laughs> he was 78, I think, when he came to preach a revival for me in my first church and takes off down the aisle and kicks his foot like that and he's got on one of these loafers like I got that doesn't tie and I almost lost it hit by the left of my Chairman Dickens in the head. <laughs> he told me afterwards, he said it, it was almost gone. But he he was down that pew and Papa used to term all the time, backsliders. We don't talk about that anymore, do we? That hurts. 
backsliders. He talked about those that, that, that claimed to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior or knew Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, but they wasn't living like it. That somewhere along the path they had left their first love. The first love is Jesus Christ. Somewhere along the path they, they get caught up in, in, the, in the briars and the tangles of this world. Somewhere along the path that, that, that the cares of this world and the deceitful of, deceitfulness of riches and all these other things choke out the word of God in their life. And they became unfruitful. What's the answer? Look what the answer is. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come to thee quickly and remove thy candlestick out of this place, except thou repent. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So here's one. He says, remember where you were at? Come back to me. I'm here and I'm waiting. This morning, if you if you got a genuine salvation experience with your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and somewhere along the path you've let just the things of this world just get you bogged down, you got so busy in just doing the stuff of life that you just haven't had time for God anymore. You just haven't had time to, to get in the Word and serve Him. You, we've been giving God all the excuses of why we can't do the things that God wants us to do. God is calling me this morning. Come back. I'm still here. I still love you. He's still drawing. That's why we feel that drawing spirit of God all the time when, we, when we've drifted away from him. That's why, by the way, whenever we've drifted away from him, we don't want to get in this book because this book is alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, any two sword, isn't it? You drifted away from God and you said, well, let me just read something. I'll just read over Leviticus. And you leave Leviticus and it gets you. You say, well, let me just read over Matthew. And there it is again. It doesn't matter where you read. God got to get you because it's in the live book. Got to speak to what's going on in our lives. That's the reason why we stay away from it whenever we have a damaged relationship with our Lord and Savior. Let me show you another picture. There's another picture in here. Step all the way over to chapter 3. This is another picture of another church that sounds a lot like. Verse 14 of chapter 3, And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou were cold nor hot. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, Key word of the whole passage, because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I heard someone talking about this recently that, that talked about this church and how this church. These believers have done this, and these believers have done that. This, this is not a church of believers, y'all. Hear the description? The description of this church is lost people. Here's the church, and he says, he said, I wish you were, you were hot or cold. And he's not saying, I want you to be hot for God or cold for God. That's not what he's saying. We have to know the geography. The geography of that area, it was surrounded by some places had hot springs, which were which were great and had medicinal value. Some places had cold springs, which were that, that wonderful, cool, refreshing water. But the water there in Laodicea was just lukewarm. If you've been outside working and you had a bottle of water, or for me it's a Coke sitting there on the lawnmower and you know, when it sat there a little too long, you've been out cutting grass for a couple hours, and you grab that coke and take a drink, and you spit it right back out. If you don't know what that's like, tomorrow morning when you get ready to take your showers, turn it faucet on nice and warm like you do your showers, and take a big gulp. I'll see how refreshing that is. <laughs> this is awesome, huh? Just, just try it. He said, it's so awesome. We just, he said, I just spit it out. Hear those that claim to be believers. Notice the counsel that he gives them in verse 18. I counsel them to buy of me gold tried in the fire, 
that thou mayest be rich in white raiment. He's saying, get the white raiment, get the robe of righteousness, that thou mayest be clothed, that thy shame, that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thy eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. As many as I love are rebuked and chastened. Be zealous therefore. And So there's two different pictures of two different, two different groups that call themselves a church. One was those that, that knew him and served him and loved him and worked for him in their lives. And then somewhere upon the lifetime lines, they, they kind of slipped away. And he said, come on back, come on back. And then there were those that never knew him. Do you love him this morning? Can you experience the love of God in your life? I think we we present such an easy salvation because we're scared. We're afraid of scaring people off. If we're afraid of scaring people off, we're not following Jesus' teachings. Do you remember the Sermon on the Mount? He, he stands up there, and all these people are gathered around the hillside to hear him. And, and as they gather around to hear him, he, he lays out the beatitudes and how to pray and all these other things. And then he says, you ready to follow me? Now come and eat my flesh and drink my blood. And they're like, what? <laughs> what are you talking about? He tried over and over again. And from, from our perspective, he tried over and over again to talk you out of believing him. He said, unless you're willing to pay the price, Unless you're willing to face the cost that comes from discipleship. Unless you're willing to stand up regardless of what comes in your life. There was one passage I wanted to read. Let me find it. Luke chapter 14. And I'd like to, like to watch it here somewhere, but I ain't looked at it at the same time. Oh, we're good. We're good. Luke chapter 14, verse 25. Listen, there went multitudes with him. So notice what he said. When, when the multitudes gathered, when the multitudes were following him, and, and were seeking to, to, to follow him, he turned and he said, If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother, and wife and children, and brother and sisters, yea, in his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. If you're not willing to place me first in your life above everything else, just go on back home. Just go on back home. That's what God's called you to do. That's the relationship that he asks, asks of us. He says, I give my life to you. And what he demands from us is his love. Our devotion because of what he's already done for us. Do we love him? Whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciples. You can read on and on. We won't, we won't read all the passage. Verse 33, it says, Whosoever he that be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. Over and over, Jesus comes to them and says, Count the cost. Just a couple more verses. I think Keith covered this before. But again, I was lost by the time, by the time he got there. He comes to the end of that story with Peter in John chapter 21. He says, Peter, do you love me? He says, Lord, you know I do. Peter, do you love me? Lord, you know I do. Peter, do you love me? You know I do. And he says in verse 18 of chapter 21, Verily, verily, I say unto you, When thou wast young, thou girdest thyself, and walkest wherever thou would. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee, and carry thee wherever thou wouldst go. This spake he, signifying by what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken thus, he said to him, Follow me. He brings Peter back to that relationship. 
he, he's restored that relationship. He's he broken down all the barriers. He's broken down all the roadblocks. He's brought him to recovery. He's brought him to reconciliation. He gets Peter back to him, and then he says, Okay, Peter, are you ready? And Peter says, I'm ready, Lord. Peter, understand, if you follow me, you will die. I just come to invite you to come and put your name on a piece of paper and join the number here at Victory Bar Road. We want you to know that you know that you know Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. Do not leave this building this morning with any doubts. Make your calls in the election short. Pete's going to come on around. Josh come on around. They're here to pray with you. They'll, they'll ask you questions. They'll lead you through. They'll, if you've got questions, they'll be glad to help you in each step of the process. So understand the scripture says, all have sinned. That included me. Yeah, that included you too. That God commended his love for us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes shall not perish but have everlasting life. This morning, would you give that heart back to Jesus Christ? If we've been like the Ephesians and, and we've been straying away from God and we've been struggling with that love relationship with God this morning, would you just tell him yes? Would you come back to him today? God loves you. He's going to draw you today. God's going to speak to your heart. Would you listen to him as he speaks? All we ask you is just obey his voice. Listen to him this morning. You watch that.
Don't say no to what the Lord is doing. If He is calling you, just take that first step and He loses the rest of the way. Let's say one more time. Come to the altar.
being a Baptist in the Baptist church is we vote and we form teams to be able to, to, to uh, my mind is so happy about what happened. <laughs> uh, we, we have the opportunity to vote and select uh, teams to be able to look for our youth pastor and a search team. And so that's what we're fixing to do. So I, I, right before we do that, I want to dismiss you. If you are a visitor and you're a part and you're looking to join the church or you just never been in one of these meetings, I would ask you to stay. I mean, what better way to see what type of church we are than to be a part of a meeting and make sure that we throw in clothes and show each other and everything else. <laughs> that we can do it in a way that's pleasing unto God. I think every church member, I would ask to stay because we, we do get to be a part of this. Um, before we do, um, we are doing offerings. As you notice, we did not take up any offering today. Because of COVID, we're still not passing the offering plates and stuff. Our offering, we have offering boxes and trays that's out uh, in the in the foyer there. You can go online. You can give online. Um, thank you for giving and being a part of being just uh, giving your tithes and offerings so that you can further the kingdom of God. At this time, I'm going to ask everyone to stand and pray. And uh, as we dismiss... Uh, if you would like to leave, it, it feel free. Uh, Reese will play a song here and it'll give us time. I don't want anyone to feel awkward. Uh, we will be out there to greet you. And then we'll get started. Remember our family as soon as uh, we'll get started here in just a few moments. If you want to be a part of the luncheon, just go across to the gym. You can be first in line. So thank you so much. Let me, let me pray for us. Our dear Father, I thank you for this day. Father, I thank you for Rufus. Lord, that got to come from Fort Payne to be in the service that he feels you draw him. Lord, thank you for his salvation. Lord, um, it just amazes me all the things that you are doing. Lord, I pray that you would be with us today, that you would walk with us and guide us in everything that we do and say. Lord, thank you for just speaking to our hearts today. Jesus' name.